it looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that, that shocked me. They don't make people that, that big. The way it moved, uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. Hey, this is Dan from Cuba, New York, and you're listening to the best podcast in all the land, Sasquatch Chronicles. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. 2022. Uh, normally, I say, you know, it's going to be a great year. I'm, you know, on and on and on. But uh, <laughs> with the track record of the last two years, I guess we'll find out together. On Friday's show, I interviewed David, and David's from Louisiana. And uh, over 40 years ago, he had shot one of these creatures at point blank range. And it's probably one of the most compelling interviews I've ever, I've ever done. It was one of those moments where you're sitting there listening to someone and you forget you're the host and you all of a sudden become a listener. I was like, oh, that's right. I'm supposed to be asking questions. Uh, but I'm hoping to put um, a portion of David's interview in the best of, in, in the next best of that I do. Uh, it's it's one of those encounters that really stays with you. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Tonight, we're going to be chatting with uh, Robert. And Robert comes to us from Kentucky. And he grew up on a, on a large piece of property, kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and he grew up with his grandfather, who was a World War II vet. And, this, and it bordered along the Daniel Boone National Forest, where Robert grew up. And there was one section of the property his grandfather would tell him he was not allowed to go. He never really explained why, but he told him to never go in this area. And uh, Robert, being a young kid, you know, teenager, he went to check the area out and uh, soon found out why his grandfather told him not to go into this area. Uh, very fascinating accounts that Robert is going to share tonight. And he's also going to share what his grandfather had seen, uh, because when he had come down from the, the mountain and told his grandfather what happened, uh, his grandfather didn't laugh. His grandfather didn't say, well, you probably saw a bear. Uh, his grandfather said to him, which one did you see? I'm excited to uh, hear what Robert has to say. Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Robert to the show. Uh, Robert, thanks for coming on. Uh, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, I really appreciate you being here, Robert. And I know there's a lot that we're going to go into tonight. And I kind of want to go out of order, if you'll forgive me for a moment. Um, I really want to hear about the moment you were bluff charged. I realize this isn't the first time you've seen the creatures, but this was the first time where you really got a good look at it. Uh, if you would, would you start from the beginning and walk us into what happened with this creature bluff charging you? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, so at that time, obviously you said back in the Daniel Boone National Forest, um, 
I decided to get up one day and uh, and just I love being outdoors. Um, so I decided I was going to do some some arrowhead hunting um, from some artifacts. Which when they do a lot of logging back home, um, anytime they do a lot of logging, obviously some of those roads, if you know that they're going to log around some of the cliffs or whatnot, uh, they tend to to pull up some stuff. So when anytime it's got a good rain after that, it's it's always good to go out and just kind of kind of look around and walk and just kind of see. Obviously, you can't dig for them, but uh, you can you can surface pick, and that's what it happened. It had a, it had rained, um, and I knew over in this this real rural pe- rural, rural part of our uh, of our town, there's there's like no houses for man 15, 20, 20 miles. It's back in the mountains. It's a I would say a gravel road, but it's not necessarily a gravel road. It's dirt, but they put gravel on it at one point in time, so it's all been kind of compacted together. Um, so it's just about as uh, rural as you can get away from everybody, which it, it all it all of it leads down to you know the backwaters to a lake. Um, so I decided I was going to do some arrowhead hunting because it just rained. Um, I jumped in my little my little car at the time, which is what I had. I was I was young. It was uh, 1992, the summer. Uh, I was 16, and at that time, of course, we didn't have the video games they have now. Uh, so we was always outside, just trying to get out and and do something. That's about all we had back home. So anyway, I go over to uh, uh, you know my dad was a logger, so I knew where a spot where they'd actually uh, grade off a pretty good sized spot at the bottom to where they would load their logs, and then they had cut around the side of the mountain and around a few of the cliffs. So I decided I was going to go over there and and park in a little flat spot off the side of the road and uh, just kind of walk around and see see what what I found. At the first little bit, uh, probably ten foot after I got out of my car, I had found a few. Uh, pieces of flint, and um, I say within 20 minutes, I'd already found an arrowhead or two just laying on top of the ground. But I kind of picked that area clean, so I decided I'd walk back a little bit further into the mountains. Uh, it was probably, I'd say, a good quarter mile to the first uh, little cliff that, that was there. Um, so I spent a little bit of time there looking around, uh, found a few more pieces there, uh, kind of picked the area clean, and I knew it was getting a little bit closer to the afternoon, so I decided I was going to, you know, knew there was another spot way back in the hills. Uh, so I just kind of walked the logging road. It was, I probably ended up walking about a total of a mile back into the mountains. Then probably spent a good hour back there. I found quite a bit, uh, quite a few, quite a few pieces of flint and a few other pieces just laying, laying in the logging road and kind of losing the track of time. Cause as you know, when you're kind of back in the hills, um, it gets dark a lot quicker than it does when you're out of there. Um, so I, uh, I hurried up and kind of got all my stuff picked up and kind of headed back and got back to my car. It, was, it wasn't dark uh, completely yet. You can still, you know, see pretty good. Uh, it's kind of that pre-darkness time of the day. And I looked and um, noticed that I had a flat tire on the back. So, you know, I opened up my trunk to, to get uh, my spare out. And, and obviously my, my spare uh, was flat as well. So... When you're 16, didn't have a lot of money at the time. We we rode rode around on what they call Maypops, uh, where you know it might pop, it might not. You tire, so it, was, it wasn't the best in the world. So I just put it, put everything in there, and I, you know, and I knew it was you know we didn't have no cell phones or anything back then, and I knew at that point where I was at, it was probably a good um, seven or eight miles back to the to the first home that you could even find, and that home was probably another four or five miles from the next one. So I knew it was getting dark, um, so I decided to go ahead and, and uh, start walking. I got probably <clears throat> no more than a couple hundred yards from my vehicle and could hear something off into the brush to my left. And, man, at that you know, at the time, I wasn't paying no attention to it because you're always hearing stuff when you're out in the hills. There's always limbs breaking or, you know, squirrels playing. There's always something that's that's there. So I just continued to walk, and then something, you know, broke something. It sounded a little bit louder. It was um, quite loud, actually, at that time. So I kind of stopped and kind of turned to look and see what was going on, um, and I couldn't really see anything. And then I just kind of stood there a few more minutes, and then, then all of a sudden I could see something moving in the brush. And uh kind of startled me a little bit, so I just, you know, being a dumb 16-year-old kid, I kind of picked up a rock that I found and kind of threw it that way. And when I did, uh, a black bear stood up. Not a massive one. It was a good-sized black bear. Probably, I guess if you want to call it a teenager, I don't know how they, they age them, but it wasn't, a, it wasn't fully grown. It was probably a good 
200 pound bear, uh, which is pretty, you'll see a lot of those young ones pretty typical uh, back in the mountains back home. So I'm like, well, you know, it, when it's standing up, it's, it, I know it's not a good thing. So I know what my grandpa and, and dad had always told me that anytime you run in something like that, you just make yourself bigger and make a lot of noise and try to run it off. So that's what I did. Um, I kind of stood my ground and uh, started yelling, you know, go away, bear. I had my arms above my head, kind of looking like an idiot, just to be honest with you. And um, it didn't it didn't phase it. it. It dropped down to all fours and then just slowly started walking towards me. And, and just, I'd say it probably got within a good maybe 10 or 12 feet. Because um, there's a ditch line across the road, uh, right at the edge of the road, and then the bank went up about four feet. And it probably got within a few feet of that bank. So it was probably a good 10 or 12 feet from where I was at. And I'm just, I'm just knowing at that time that that this thing is, is just going to come and get me. So I knew if I run, it's not going to do any good. So I just kind of still held my ground and just got louder and just yelled at the top of my lungs um, just as loud as I could. And then all of a sudden, I'd say probably 60, 70 yards up the hill, this place had obviously been logged, so there's a there's a thicket that it grew up underneath it. Something just just the loudest roar um, I can think of. Just the, the I can't, it's hard to really describe the sound of it. And then you just hear something just barreling down the hill, and I'm like, I don't know what's going on. Uh, I kind of turn my my head that way, and then I notice uh, that I see the bear move, so I turn my eyes back to the bear, and it actually turned looked up that direction and then turned to my left if I'm facing it and ran down the hill, down the ditch, across the road and over the hill. And it's a pretty steep bank on the other side and it never stopped. No, I say two seconds after it had actually um, crossed the road. This thing, um, sorry if you hear some chatter in my voice right now, it's just repeating what it was. It kind of brings it back to the moment. It just... <sighs> It's it's really hard to describe. It literally came, and we're talking about a four foot embankment. It cleared the embankment, landed in the road, probably landed three or four feet in the road on, and kind of landed with its back feet and down then to its like its hands in the front on all fours, but the back feet kind of hit first. And it had such a speed that it actually slid to the edge of the road. It, this thing was it, it's just it's just massive. Um, so I. I stumble backwards, fall down, uh, fall on my butt, um, lower part of my back. And I'm just sitting there with, you know, leaning back on my hands, looking at it, just really can't move, not knowing what's going on. And then it, as it stopped, it turns, um, it doesn't turn its head. It kind of turns its body around and stands up on all fours or stands up off all fours on his two feet. And it's, it has to be seven and a half eight feet tall. It's It's got a darkish color, but it's also got a lot of white mixed into it. Um, like, you know, like if a person's got a peppery type hair, then all of a sudden they got a lot of white blended into it. It's like it's got some age to it. This thing's broad, broad chest. I mean, I'm a pretty good sized guy. Um, I'm six feet. Um, at that time, I was probably around 220, 230. Uh, I was a good sized teenager. It just, you know, broad shoulders. It doubled what I was. I say they're at least four feet wide. But one thing that stood out to me is when it, before it had turned around, it's like the back left shoulder. It's like if you're, so if you're a baseball player and you slide in the dirt, slide in the gravel, you get just the whole side of your leg, just kind of that, like that road rash type deal. It just, it rips all the hair off and, and scabs the whole side of your leg. Well, that's what its shoulder was like. It was, it looked like it was probably a foot and a half long on its shoulder. Like it, I don't know if it's, had slid or um, got the fight. I, I don't know. It's just that thing that stood out to me because it, it, you could just know, you could see that. And then when it had stood up and turned around, obviously, you know, the eyes are jet black. Um, the nose was, man, it's um, flat, hooded. Um, I guess that's what they call it. It just, the real nostrils are really flat and really wide. Uh, there's not like a bridge of the nose like I have. Um, it's kind of like stubby. I guess it's like a, a UFC fighter has been been beaten ahead a, a one too many times, but there was no hair around its face. It's it just I never seen it, never seen any teeth or anything like that. But it just the eyes. Um, I'm, I'm just picturing it right now in my head. Um, they're just they're real dark, and uh, so it's 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 just sitting there staring at me, and obviously I'm not moving. And then it 
just randomly takes two quick steps towards me and just this big grunish type growl, I jump up and just take off running as, as hard as I can. I uh, probably run for, oh, it felt like an hour, but probably wasn't literally 10 seconds. Turned around to look and see if it was back there and seen it still standing there. So I slowed down a little bit. And the very second that I slowed down, it took off just two more big, like two or three big steps, uh, like a, I don't know if you call it a bluff charge or whatever you want. But this time when it come at me, it just let out this, I can't, I can't even, it, so if I was to say like leave, but just in this big sound, it, it, it just like it just almost knock you down. It's like it's just telling me to get, you know what, out of, out of that area. Um, so then I just turned and ran. I never looked back. I kept on going. I didn't hear anything behind me because I knew just at any second that it was, I was just waiting to get grabbed from behind. I didn't stop. And I don't know how long I ran. Uh, I didn't stop. Um, and finally come up on two people driving a little Toyota pickup truck at the time. I uh, was just coming that direction. But I know I had probably it ran at least a half hour uh, on that road, just nonstop as fast as I could go. What an amazing account. You know, black bears' behavior in general is they generally are very skittish around people, obviously when they're young aren't around. But, you know, if you get a black bear alone and you're yelling and you're trying to make yourself big, which is really what you should do, um, and it still keeps coming and it's coming your direction, uh, there's probably something wrong with that bear and you're in big trouble if it gets a hold of you. Uh, you know, the whole situation, and then you see this other a uh, strange creature come down on all fours, chase it off, and then it, when it directs its attention at you, uh, it stands up, and uh, now you're face to face with it. And I know with this, this is kind of your the main sighting where you really got to look at the creature. But it wasn't your only uh, encounter or sighting with them. Uh, what do you think was going on in this situation? I mean, I know that you don't know, and I don't know, but what's your opinion of what was going on here? Man, I've had almost 30 years to to sit and think about it, um, and I replay it a lot. I, I don't know if it was – so I, went, I told my grandfather uh, that night is who I was staying with when I got back. Uh, we've had – me and him had a few conversations about a few other encounters as well. He always told me not to tell anybody anything because they'd wrap me up in a straitjacket, but he had seen them as well at different locations at different times. But I told him what had happened – and he just usually he's he's always calm, but he just kind of said, you know what? Maybe it was running the bear off and trying to save you. Why? I I have no idea. I don't know if it was doing that or if if it had actually been stalking the bear and that was what it was going to do. And because it wasn't a large bear, it would have been one that could easily took down without any trouble whatsoever. The size of it, how big it was. Um, and I don't know if it was saying, hey, listen, this is my prey. You need to get out of here or what. But I just knew at that time that it, with that sound that it made in that second charge, if I had not ran, if I'd stood there, you wouldn't be talking to me today. It just it, it was that, hey, this is this is I'm warning you go type situation. Yeah, I can't wait to kind of go into some of your other encounters and also to what your grandfather uh, told you as far as what he saw. Um, and we'll get into all that here in a moment. Uh, two questions I want to ask you. One, how far away from you was the creature when it stood up? And as far as the face, when you were looking at the face, did it remind you more of a human? Did it remind you more of like a non-human primate? Yeah, so the distance-wise, um, where the bear crossed it, I got a good look. You know, I, I can vividly remember where the bear cutting across it. Probably cut, so it was about 10 or 12 feet from when it first when it was there in front of me, then and when it cut to my left and run down the ditch where it hit the road at, ended up being about 30 feet away. And it probably ended as it was going at an angle, cause it was kind of in a curve. Uh, it probably was about 40 feet where it went over the bank and where this thing was at probably would have been about 35 to 40 feet from where it was at, which is not, not you know, it's not a good, it's a, a bow hunt. Um, so it's not very far as far as, uh, yardage wise. It's, no, it's close. close enough to really, really see, uh, and feel everything going on. But the face, um, you, you hear people talk about, and I've seen the Patty video now where it's got, you know, the big crest on the head and 
it didn't look like it. It, it just it, it had a really big forehead and big eyebrows, and uh, the head kind of sloped back. It didn't have that typical crown. Um, it didn't look it didn't look ape like. Um, I, I don't know. It, it almost Neanderthal ish with that you know the big protruding eyebrows. You know what I'm talking about with that big forehead that slopes back. But the eyes were just really wide from the nose. I mean, you know, with us, what do you got a finger or two between your eyes and your nose? This thing, you could have probably put three or four fingers between where their eyes were at. Um, that's how wide it was. It's just a massive, massive head on it. Um, and I mean, right down to the wrinkles on the forehead, when it just turned around and looked, it just, just, it, yeah, it was um, not the most pleasant vision I've got in my mind. I just knew that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, wasn't messing around, but, you know, talking about, you know, it had the white stuff on it, which, you know, you asked, talked about my grandfather, which we'll talk about here in a second. That's, that kind of comes into play with something that uh, he had told me about with some of his encounters as well. Yeah. And I definitely want to chat about your grandfather's accounts and we'll go into um, these other incidences that happened to you on the property. I want to ask you before we go into all of that, you know, this thing comes rushing down the mountain the bear runs off, it stands up and it turns around and it looks at you. Um, and I know we're going back, you know, over 30 years ago. Did you know what it was or at that moment in time were you like, the hell is this thing? I knew at that, at that encounter, yes. The first encounter I had a few weeks before that, no, I had no idea what it was. But at that time he had told me after a conversation that him and I had had um, kind of what it was, what I was looking at. Um, I mean, the other thing about it, too, is when it stood up, it's not, not standing straight up like us. It's stand up, leaning forward still. The arms were <sighs> to its knees. I mean, they're just massive, long. Um, you know, it's if you got bad posture as a kid, that's pretty much what it would remind you of. It's what my mom always threatened me. Hey, you know, if you don't stand up right, you're going to stay. Uh, your your shoulders are going to slouch. And that's kind of what it was. This thing was it was just massive, um, long, long. Um, thigh muscles uh it was kind of odd though from the knees down it wasn't very long like you know the uh, the calf muscles that, that part of the leg wasn't as long as what the thigh muscles were they were they were quite large and quite long it's kind of kind of odd looking yeah i hear you so you kind of you kind of knew what it was at this point um and in the first encounter we'll talk about here in a second and i know at that moment you didn't really know what it was let me ask you, and I know this is just your opinion, but I I really want your opinion. Why do you think it didn't kill you? Um, honestly, probably because I ran. Other than that, unless somebody, the good Lord above, is looking after me, I have no idea because I was alone. It wasn't pitch black yet. I could still see very well. If I hadn't ran, if I'd stood still, it probably would have. Um, I think it was giving me an opportunity to get away. That's the only thing I can think of to this day. Um, and it still bothers me to this day. Uh, like I said, I'm a deer hunter. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I sent you the email the other day and talking about it. And I talked to a few friends about it here recently and who's, who's, who's asked me to do some things with it, which, you know, I'm, they've been asking me to, you know, to put some of my stories down on paper just so that, you know, they think there's a lot more people back home that are afraid to talk about it, but they know about it. So I'm trying to write some stuff down to, to let a few people read. So hopefully they'll and to get more people talking about it back home. Cause not people, not very many people do or will. Um, but like right now, just going over it and talking again, like I can pull, we have a farm here. If I get home, home late at night, I've got to where I just, take my headlights, I cut to the left when I'm pulling my driveway, cut it around to my right just so I can scan the tree line um, before I get out of the vehicle. I'm 46-year-old, <laughs> guns, I mean, you name it. But, you know, just because of, of talking about this and um, sending the email and stuff and, and kind of reliving it, it's uh, it's got me doing back some of the stuff I did when I was younger after I first seen it, which is just kind of weird. Yeah, I really appreciate you sharing it, though, very much. You know, a lot of people, when they have encounters, it, one, it always stays with you throughout your whole life. Uh, but, you know, it does affect different people in different ways. And you talking about the behavior of, you know, you're scanning around everywhere in the as you pull into your driveway. 
I, I think that's more than understandable. Um, you had mentioned a couple weeks earlier you had, uh, it was kind of your first encounter. If you would, tell me about that. Yeah, so um, I just had got to my grandfather's house uh, for the summer. I'm going to stay down. Now, we lived in Ohio at the time, and my dad and grandparents lived back in, in back home. Um, obviously, mom and dad were divorced. Uh, so I always went down and spent the summers, and, of course, she worked all the time. So it gave me a chance to go back to the hills. And, you know, my grandfather was kind of like – he was kind of like my dad. So, you know, when I get when I get down there, I was talking to him. I was like, you know what? Um, yeah, he knew I was into at that time, you know. Planned on being an archaeologist as a kid. Obviously, I didn't pan out uh, <laughs> the way I like to. Uh, but they, he had told me that there's always some rock cliffs up to the top of the mountain behind the home where they lived at. So I thought, you know what, be a good spot to look. Uh, maybe I can, you know, see some some paintings from um, Native Americans or something because that whole area back home is is a lot like that. So I told him, I said, you know what, I, you know, where's that stuff at? So where's this? Where these rocks and cliffs you're talking about at? And I also talked to my grandfather. I said, I want to walk up there and, um, you know, go see it. Um, and that's what he told me. He said, no, um, I, I don't want you going up there. And I said, well, what do you mean you don't want me going up there? He said, well, there's there's some things up there that you don't want to, um, you don't want to get around, don't want to bother. Um, and this is, you know, my grandfather, World War II vet, has no fear in anything in life. And that's, that's, that's just, that's coming at that lightly. So I made him sit down and you know explain to me what it was on. That's, that's the first time he, he told me about the woolly booger. He said there was um, he's encountered three different ones. He's encountered a young one. He encountered a very mass one. He said it was black. He said it had to be eight or nine feet tall. Um, and then he said he he'd ran into one that was that was young, or not young, but it was an older one. It had a lot of white on it. Um, he said it was you know that one. He's ran into more more not. Um, and he said it was just it was kind of really kind of really passive it was never aggressive with him um but the one big black one he said he he didn't want to be within you know 10 miles of it he said it was very very hostile um and you know my grandfather like I said being a world war ii vet he would go out in the hills and you could actually drive up to the top of that mountain but it was a long way you know you could hike up to it in a couple hours from where we were at but to go around the mountains and the ridge tops to get to it you no know, the old logging roads would take you you know 10 miles to get back there um, and he would do that. He would go back there and sit all day long and, and eat some snacks and just sit and kind of be by himself. So I said, you know, I told him, I said, you know what? I want to go, you know, I just, I want to, I want to go look. I don't think that stuff's there. I think you're just pulling my leg. And he made me promise that day. He said, listen, don't go. You know, I'm asking you not to go. So I, I told him I wouldn't. Um, but the next day, uh, my grandmother took him over to um, the doctor, which I knew is, you know, to town. It was an all day trip for him. So while they was gone, I decided, you know what, um, I'm going to go up to the to the rock cliffs by myself. Uh, so I grabbed a few things, machete to cut through some of the underbrush. Again, some of this, these mountains have been logged. There was a lot of logging back then in the 80s, 90s. Um, so there was a lot of undergrowth that happened. So you had to cut through some of the stuff to, to make your own trail. So I'd done that, and it took me about two hours uh, to get to the top. And when I was at the top up there, um, there's just this overhang this rock cliff uh so i'll go for a walk and, and just kind of look at it um and just seeing you know there's something you know if, am i seeing any soot on the ceiling where there was fires built or am i seeing anything on the ground and i, I was kind of noticing like some of the ceiling had fell down onto the ground and there were a lot of flat rocks and in the back corner there was a lot of didn't make sense there was a lot of leaves and a lot of like treetops and trees laying down it's almost like something that made a nest so i'm standing there looking at it i uh, hear this big screeching sound and I knew what that sound was. Um uh, heard it a bunch. Uh, I knew it was a bobcat. So as I'm kind of standing there looking around, I look to the right and around the ridge around the um the cliff overhang where I'm at to the right hand side, um it kind of slopes down like the hill does around that side, kind of the dirt around the edges and I could see it it started walking down. So it started walking towards me. Um so I know at that time it's you know it wasn't a huge bobcat but it was enough to put a put damage on person. And all I had was you know, a little ax that I brought with me to cut some stuff down and my little, uh, a little machete, uh, or hatchet, however you want to call it. Um, so I started backing up and backing down the hill, uh, and it just slowly walked towards me, just doing what it does, making the loud squeals, loud sounds. Uh, it kind of reminds you of the video I seen with, uh, I think it was the guy in Utah backing up from a cougar. I don't know if you've seen that YouTube video or not. It keeps, you know, coming at him, 
and he keeps walking back, seemed like forever. That's kind of what was going on. Except it wasn't doing too much, uh, maybe a five or six foot lunge and then stopping, uh, which was typical uh, back home. But I ended up walking back probably about 50 foot backwards. And then all of a sudden it just stops and it kind of looks up to the hill to the right and then just bolts. I mean, just same way it came from, just at a dead run. And it made no sense. Uh, I had no, I didn't do anything to scare it. I didn't know what was going on. So I looked up to the hill up top just to see, hey, you know, what, what is it? What what's, what ran it off? Um, couldn't see anything. So it just, as I'm sitting there, I'm kind of getting a little uneasy. Uh, so I decided, you know, I know there's bear, I know there's mountain lions in the area. Um, or even, even talks of a black panther, which I never got to see before, but there's even talks of that uh, back home. So I turned around and, and started walking down the hill, probably walk a good 50 yards or so. And then I hear something behind me, so I stop and turn around really quick. And probably about 75, 80 yards up the hill, I see something out of the corner of my eye just kind of dart behind a big beech tree. When I say big beech tree, I mean they're huge beech trees that I could probably hide you know, two people behind because uh, they didn't cut those down. Uh, that's the, pretty, pretty much the only trees they didn't cut down back then were these big beeches in the area. And I couldn't figure out what it was. I thought, man, well, maybe something's messing with me or, or, or playing around with me. Uh, or it's just my eyes are, are messing with me. So I just kind of turned and started walking back down the hill again. And then I hear just, you know, another little little crunch. And I just turn around real quick. I don't see anything. Um, but I, but I've got a smell now. There's something something like just like a dead, dying mangy wet I, I don't it's just a hard smell to describe i mean i'm just imagine a i guess a dog that's you know never been taken care of been outside sleeping his own urine it was just it was a really pungent smell um that just hit me and i don't i hadn't smelled it before so i don't know you know where it was coming from and i couldn't see anything at that time there, there wasn't too much of a thicket at that point at the top of the hill uh the thicket's more down towards the middle part of the mountain so instead of you know, walking forward down the hill, I started to walk backwards uh, just so I could keep my eyes forward and, and what's up the mountain. And as I'm walking backwards, probably taking two, three steps, I see this thing lean out from behind uh, a big tree. And from the thing that had, I had saw kind of glance out of the corner of my eye before, it was about 75, 80 yards, I think it was. This time it was probably about 30. Um, and I moved pretty fast. And how it got that close, I don't know. But as I'm facing up the hill and there's a tree up there, it leans out to my right, which will be its left. I can see three quarters of its head. Uh, I can see both eyes, nose, face, um, the left shoulder, and probably about half of its torso. And the rest of the waist and stuff were behind the tree. It looked maybe my size, about six feet tall. Um, had a reddish tint kind of it's not fur, it's, it's hair, but you could tell it looked young. The eyes were um, not as dark as the one I'd saw in the road. But at that time, I'm, I'm not knowing what's going on. I'm having to focus. I'm like, it's not a bear because bears don't do that. I'm not sure what this thing is. It's not moving. It's not blinking. It's not doing anything. So I turn um, at a dead run and just really bolted the rest of the way back down the mountain. Uh, got to the front yard. Uh, you know, my grandparents had a single wide trailer. I got around the, from the back of the trailer to the front yard and just literally laid down into the yard. Just like my heart's kind of come out of my chest. Um, that was the first time I ever saw anything. Didn't know what it was at the time. Um, and then, you know, of course, when I'm, when I'm back there, I'm, I'm laying there trying to put, you know, two and two together, figure out what was that. Then I remember what my grandfather had told me. And I was like, that had to be what he's talking about. So when they came home, um, obviously I told him what had happened and that didn't go over too well, as you can imagine, because he had already told me not to. I basically had lied to him and told him that I wouldn't go, but I did anyway. Um, I told him what I see, and the first thing he said, w which one did you see? And that's when I explained to him what it was. He said, so you've probably seen the young one. Um, he told me I was lucky um, that to never go back up there again. And uh, that's, you know, it's the woolly boogers, what he called it, which I now know to be a you know, Sasquatch, Bigfoot. Yeah, I would imagine even in that moment, it becomes even more real uh, because here's your grandfather, a man that you admired and really raised you. Uh, he's 
he's not making fun of you. He's like, which which one did you see? Were those the only incidences that happened to you on the property? No, that was so. That was the first one. Was the one I just told you about. The second one was there. Um, the visual. I've, I had another uh, in between that. Those two times, another thing. I don't think it was a visual. It was. I was fishing in a pond not far from from the house up there, and rocks were being thrown um, into the water uh, around me, which I first thought were fish jumping. I was kind of getting excited and didn't know what it was. I thought somebody, you know, somebody's come up there because there's a place everybody went fishing. Somebody was messing with me, uh, so I actually threw a rock back. Um, and heard a thud as opposed to hearing the normal stuff I hit. And then just a big growl and a pretty good sized rock came past me. Um, and then I ran back to the house that day. I mean, that there was not seeing anything, but um, now that I look back at it at the time, I didn't think nothing about it, but I, I, there's nothing going to throw a rock back at me. That's, that's going to do that. Cause if I'd hit somebody with, you know, they would at least made an owl sound or something. So I'm, I'm, I'm just assuming right now, obviously I can't prove it, but that I'm assuming that was the second time I'd, I'd actually had an encounter was that one. And that was right before um, I made the trip and seen the one in the middle of the road. Yeah. And I know you had mentioned some of the brief encounters, uh, kind of an overview of what your grandfather told you. Did he sit down with you and go into detail about his encounters and really what happened to him? Yeah, he, um, when I'd ask about it, the first he was kind of upset that I went up to the, you know, the hill at that time. He said, you know, that's something we'll talk about another day. He said, I don't want to go into it and, and talk too much about it, but, you know, just never to go back up that hill again, which I agreed. Um, I didn't want to go up there and see exactly, you know, what I just saw. Um, still couldn't make heads or tails of what it was at that time, other than just, hey, it's a woolly booger. Um, the second one, though, uh, the actual visual when I, you know, I told him about uh, when, I, when I finally, you know, so the people that picked me up in the truck actually took me back to my grandparents' house um, and they had a tire and a rim there. They had a few old tires and rims because uh, my dad had a car that was similar. Uh, they took me back and we changed, they actually helped me change the flat for myself and I brought my car back home that night. So when I got back that night, um, this is at this time, it was probably one o'clock in the morning. It was pretty late after making all the trips back and forth. But, um, you know, that, that's when he sat down and he, he told me, he said, listen, he said, um, to him, it sounded like, you know, that it was protecting me because honestly, the bear was probably going to attack because nothing I was doing was working. It wasn't phasing it. It, it, it wasn't even flinching. So, and, I, and then I asked him, I said, you know, what if, you know, you've seen these things, you know, what are they? So I'm not going too much detail. It's kind of late. Um, but I will tell you that if you see a bit, the, the real big one, the real dark one, the black one, it's not good. He said he, he thinks that it's the, he called it the alpha, you know, like the wolf, the head of the wolf pack. Um, he's, he says he thinks it's the big protector. He told me that the gray one that he had saw, had a lot of gray on it, so I don't think it's the same what I saw because what I saw had gray uh, and white hairs. It just wasn't the the same you know, the amount that what he had saw. The one he told me, he said it looked aged pretty well. He said actually that was pretty passive. He he told me that he was sitting on top of the hill uh, one day. He uh, one of the favorite things he loved to eat was a can of sardines. He would open up sardines and pour hot sauce in it. Which how in the world his stomach held that? I have no idea. Um, but he would just go and sit on top of the hills, um, sit in a while out just to get away from himself, which, you know, if you know people that's been in war and stuff like that, that's a common thing. They like to be by themselves at times. Um, and he said he'd opened up a can of sardines and was just sitting there on the, on the back of his tailgate on his truck. And he's just looking down the hill and just seen it standing there. He had no idea how it got there and no idea what happened. He said it frightened him, uh, but he didn't. He didn't move. Obviously, I guess you know, being in the war and seeing the things that he had saw, probably it takes a lot to scare you at that time. He said so. He just he said, you know what? I just decided to take my can of sardines, and oh, he said he walked over to the edge of the little logging road where he's parked at and set it on the bank, and just walked back to his vehicle, jumped in, and kind of drove off. But he said he probably looked at it for a good five or ten minutes, and it just stood there and stared, never moved, never flinched. Um, he said you could see it kind of swaying a little bit, um, like it's standing still, just kind of a shift and left or right, but nothing major that would stand out, but that's the only movement he's seen out of it. But he said he went back over the next day. Uh, the can of sardines were gone. Of course, anything could have got the sardines, but he said he would go up about every two weeks or so after that, and he would take something up there and just, just leave something laying. Um, it could be apples that he had. Uh, could be he could be eating a loaf of bread. He said he'd leave some pieces of bread or something at the spot the entire time. And 
he said over a while he had noticed and he had seen it a few times. And then, you know, the last time he had done it's when he had saw the the big one with the young one, the the big black one with that uh, the young one on top of the hill. Uh, and he said the big black one was just grabbing trees and shaking trees and throwing stuff, just anything he could grab his hands on and just acting like it was having a tantrum. And he said the young one actually took off down the hill the opposite direction. Uh, I mean, that was the last time he went back to that spot. I could see why you would admire your grandfather. You know, a lot of times when people say, I saw Sasquatch, uh, most of the time family uh, makes fun of you or they don't believe you. Uh, Not only did your grandfather believe you, but he sat down and shared with you what he saw and what he experienced. And, you know, this is the reason why I don't want you to go into this area. Your grandfather sounds like the coolest guy on the planet. He was, man. He really was. And unfortunately, that was the... That was the last summer I had with him. Um, it wasn't a month after that that he actually passed away. So, oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. I mean, you guys had one thing you can look back on is that your grandfather and you kind of had this moment in time to, uh, uh, you know, even though it, it has to do with Bigfoot, you know, he was willing to share that with you. And most of those World War II guys don't share much, man. They're the toughest guys on the planet. Prior to him passing away, did he ever tell you what he thought these creatures are? No. Uh, he, he just, all we'd ever say was was a woolly bugger. I'm sure that if he'd been, you know, alive much longer, we probably would have talked about it a lot more. Uh, all he would tell me is just don't tell nobody about it. He said he had never told anybody other than me. And, and come to find, he told me a lot of war stories, too. And come to find out from some of the family that um, I was the only one he'd ever opened up to. Um, like I said, he was more of a dad to me than anything. Um, and me and him had a real close bond. So I guess he was comfortable enough to let me know kind of what was going on. And I guess kind of tell me, hey, listen, don't go up to the area that you just, you know, you said you want to go up here, but don't go up here and here's why. But I end up, I did tell my mom. He told me not to tell anybody. So I actually told her, uh, which I didn't tell you this in the email. Um, and I said, listen, this is what's going on down at my grandpa's. This was after the the incident in the road. I said, you know, I didn't, didn't know if I should tell you or not. You know, Papa told me that um, you might have had me com- committed, put a straight jacket. And um, that's my mom, just quiet. And she said, no, she said, because I've seen them too. So and I'm like, what, what do you mean you've seen them too? And she said, well, she said, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and, and tell you a story. And that's when she started telling me about when she was a kid. Um, she had, you know, there's six of them. There's uh, three girls, three boys, my grandmother and, and uh, her grandpa. And they'd lived, which the hollow that they lived in, it took about 30 minutes to get from where my grandfather lived. But it probably wasn't five miles if you, you know, the way a crow flies from ridge top to ridge top. It wasn't that far that way. But to get around to it, because the mountains, just the way the mountains are, it's probably a half hour. When she was a little kid, um, uh, her dad was at work, uh, which is my grandfather, and all of them were out in the, the garden. That's that's what they had back then, was just you raising your own food. And her little brother, who's the youngest one, um, her um, her mom, which was my granny, had set him down on a blanket you know, on the edge of the garden um, and said they were just working away and, you know, just heard my, she said she was, she was just sitting there working and then heard my uh, with my grandmother, which is her mom, just kind of gasp, and they looked at her, and she was looking the opposite direction for uh, uh, my uncle, which is you know her baby brother was at, and he's laying on the blanket, and my mom said when she turned and looked about twenty foot behind him in the edge of the tree line there, which is you know at the time when you raised gardens back then, it's kind of on a hillside, you know what I'm talking about. It's not like necessarily in the bottom because it's all you had, and said on the hillside uh, there just stood this big black creature she said of course she didn't know what it was she you know of course later on in her life she calls it a bigfoot now uh, and these are people that go to church every single day there's you know if, if they was to do something in, in a house on accident they're going to tell you about it they don't they won't lie for nothing but all of them all of them saw it standing there um instead of sitting there just staring down at her you know at her baby brother um so they actually ran and and grabbed uh, her granny actually ran and grabbed the baby grabbed the kids put them in the house and she actually grabbed the gun. And when she walked back to the porch, it was gone, which is kind of interesting because she said the next day, uh, because they all kind of, you know, her, her dad and then his brothers kind of lived in the same hollow. So the next day uh, that her brother came up and they was telling, you know, him what had happened. uh, Cause you know, obviously that 
her dad didn't really believe too much. They just thought, oh, we just seen a bear or something. And they said that, um, you know, her brother, I can't, I can't remember which one it was, or I'm not going to use the name here anyway, because they probably don't want me telling it, but said that he'd looked out his window, thought he'd seen something in the front yard. He walked out the door onto the front porch, and there stood this big creature, uh, probably 20 foot from his porch. And what was odd about it, said he was standing there and looked at him, and it kind of took its hands and kind of gestured to come here. He said that he turned around, went back in the house to grab his gun and come back out, and it was gone. Had no idea where it went to. Um, so they end up grabbing the dogs and going after this area, trying to you know trying to find it in the hills. It ended up killing two other dogs. They could see it; its a silhouette on top of the mountain because it had got dark when it when it actually ran into it. Um, and then they just kind of left the hills, got back, uh, and then it kind of went away. They never saw it anymore over there. But that's a whole other encounter that they had, and that's thirty years prior to what I'd ran into. But it's literally five miles apart if you look, you know, the, the way a crow flies on top of a ridge, which I thought was kind of interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting, actually, what your mom had to say, especially with the motion, the creature making the motion of come here. Um, I've, I've heard that before, and I take pause when I hear that. i um, not, not a huge fan of the creatures making motion of coming here, especially to kids. Um, you know, and, and, and the fact that more than just you and your grandfather are seeing it now, now your mom and your uncle and your grandmother uh, are also seeing the creatures. And it sounds like the creatures were on this property for a very long time. Why do you think that they were there, specifically up on the ridge, but why do you think that they were hanging around that property? So not far from, from this area, there's, there's a pretty massive lake. Um, there's a ton of wildlife. Everybody's raising gardens. Um, I think that they just they stay there. They live there. The food's easy to get to. Uh, there's always corn. There's always potatoes. There's always veggies hanging around every hollow, every house at those times, and even today. And there's plenty of water to get to. There's plenty of shelter. There's there's nobody going back to these mountains. Cause they're not. It's not like a little knowledge you can walk upon to really climb to the top of these mountains to where these cliffs and stuff are at. It's it, it takes a good hike. Um, and not a lot of people do it anymore. Um, and there's, they can stay hidden. I mean, you can, you can go, if you want to just disappear, it's a good area. You can go and just go and live your life and nobody probably ever find you again. Yeah. Have you gone back to the property or back to the area where you had, uh, these encounters? I have never been back up that hill. Don't ever care if I ever go back up there. Um, I have drove through, uh, the area of the road, uh, to go to that lake a few times to where the encounter was at the road. But never at dark. Um, never want to go at dark at all. I uh, don't care if I ever go back there at, at night through that through that area. Um, it's kind of you know hesitant going during the daytime there, and I and I don't go by myself. I've always taken somebody with me. Um, it's just it's just when you come around that curve to that spot right to this day, it's uh, just a very uneasy feeling. Yeah, who could blame you though? Uh, one of the other questions I wanted to ask you was, uh, did you guys ever see the lights on that property or did your grandparents ever talk about uh, seeing strange lights? No, um, no, not at all there. I mean, you always hear people talk about lights and stuff. They've seen the skies, but uh, nothing like that. And I've not seen any lights or anything in those areas. Um, none of that stuff. You know, these really are some of my favorite encounters, especially when it's a, a property and there's multiple family members seeing it and over generations that are seeing it. Uh, you definitely gain a lot of insight. And, you know, I really appreciate you sharing it. Uh, let me ask you, and there's no wrong answer, uh, but if someone were to ask you, uh, because you had the opportunity to see this creature so close, uh, if someone were to ask you, what do you think Sasquatch is, what would you say? It, I mean, from just the facial features and uh, the way their bodies are made and, um, you know, it, it, they've got some kind of intelligence to them, at, period. Because if not, then, you know, I wouldn't be here telling the story because if it was just like, the you know, the way a bear thought, that thing would have killed me. Um, but they're very curious. Um, I think they have to be, to me, some kind of cross between a human uh, ape type. I, I don't know if it's something that's left over from the ancient age that's, you know, if you think about it, it, it wasn't been the last 60 years. We really got to some of the areas. Everything's been so rural, the mountains, nobody's really explored too deep into the mountains or they have and haven't said anything. So these things have had plenty of places to live and plenty of places to hide. 
uh, I think now we're just we're getting back to where there are areas and you're just starting to come out more uh, because we're just taking more of more of the land away. Um, I think they've always been there. I don't think they're supernatural. Um, I've done my fair share of ghost hunting in my life. Uh, I will tell you that, and I've, I know what that side of it's like, and it's, it's not the same from what I've experienced anyway in my in my situation. Uh, I just think it's something that's left over. It's uh, it's a cross between um, a human um, and uh, sometimes some type of ape, uh, an, an intelligent hairy Neanderthal. Who knows? I, I don't know. Yeah, I hear you, and that's a fair answer. Um, would you want to see another one? <sighs> if I had ten people with me, it was daytime. I was two hundred yards away, and all of us had guns. Probably, um, even though this thing, you know, I, I think allowed me to live and, and protect me from that bear. That night's my opinion. I still don't want to see them again because just just the way that it looked, and and it's just knowing that there's nothing I could do. Um, if it decided to go a different route there would be no way that I could possibly defend myself no matter what gun I had, no matter what situation I was in. It's just if, if it wanted to do something, it's going to do it. So I, I honestly could care if I ever see one again. Um, and unfortunately, like my wife, my wife believes my stories. I've told her about it. Uh, but of course, she still says that she has to see one. And um, I just hope that she never, hope she always feels that way because I never want her to see one to really, to, to get to become that believer because it, it affects your life in a lot of ways. Like I said, I'm, I'm a hunter. Uh, when I go deer hunting right now, I, I wait to the almost to the sun's starting to crest a little bit so it's not to pitch black before I even go into the hills. So it's it's, it's been a lie. It's, it's, it's changed the life and changed the way I've done things. Yeah, without a doubt. I think everyone who's had an encounter, it definitely affects your life, um, good and bad. Uh, there's definitely a lot of negative impact after you've had an encounter, but you know, the one thing that's positive uh, is it's very eye-opening and you're more, I would say, on high alert when when you're out there. You know, some people, who they'll choose not to go hunting anymore, um, but some people choose to, you know, get back into hunting or hiking or what they were doing before. Uh, but this time around, you're definitely more on high alert. You know what I mean? Listen, I can drive down the road and uh, and my eyes are constantly scanning out of the corners of, of anything that's standing out. It's It doesn't matter where you're at. If there's a tree, I'm catching the corner of the tree just to see if I see anything. So it definitely changes your surroundings. Um, it makes you more aware of everything in life. It's just, yeah, it's definitely, it's life altering uh, to the way you actually perceive things now. Yeah, without a doubt. And I really enjoyed chatting with you, Robert. Thank you so much for taking the time to share what happened to you and also share what happened to your family and, you know, the stories of your grandfather. Um, I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, like I said, I've got a, a, a friend of mine who's actually an author who's who's been pounding my head to put this down so I can, you know, at least get the people back home to read it. Maybe we can get some more stories out of there because I truly believe that, you know, that's 30 years apart between my mom and my sightings. Um, and, you know, I was talking not too long ago to my dad and he, you know, I told him, what I was doing. Uh, he told me my cousin um, had saw some of the same stuff when he was logging because he's a logger. Um, and it's somewhat in the gen same general area. So I, I know that stuff's there and it still happens, still going on. I just think people are afraid to talk about it. So I'm going to try to do something to get to make that change because people need to know about what's going on there. Yeah. Well, let me know if you end up doing it. If there's anything I can do to help, you know, if it's promoting it or whatever I can do to kind of help you. So hopefully we'll chat again in the future. Uh, but I really appreciate you coming on. Thanks so much for being a part of the show. All right. Thanks a lot, buddy. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance to check out sasquatchchronicles.com, you can become a member and get additional shows. Until next time, everyone.